about this bacterial turnover, where bacterial numbers go up, then they die, and they, those balloons burst, the balloons of their body burst, kind of hold soil together. But it's also, I don't know if I mentioned, earthworms cruising through the soil, they're slimy. Some of that slime falls off on the soil particles. Lots of earthworms, lots of slime, to kind of bind these particles together into these stable aggregates. They're really crumbs. But there's also, when you think about well, why we're so keen on cover crops, think about what a cover crop's doing, or any crop for that matter, but particularly a cover crop. All those roots are going out in the soil, and we're just giving it, giving that to the soil. So as the plant's growing down, all these roots are moving into the soil, some of them quite deep. And some people say, well, how would I ever get organic matter way down in the soil? I'd have to lay it on the surface and plow it two feet down to get it two feet down in there. But in fact, if a root grows two feet deep and the plant dies, there's this channel, particularly with something like alfalfa or clover, there's this two foot long tap root it's going to die right there. When it dies, it's going to leave this big space. Probably an earthworm will follow it down to eat it, or another root can go down that space. So actually, I've gotten organic matter way down in the soil by growing it. And that's one of the... Okay, so I got our... Two and a half minutes on this one. <clears throat> and so the big idea is that we can change... Remember, it's just a demonstration. But you can see very clearly that we get different numbers. Let me see. It's, I, I love it as a demo because mm -hmm. uh, it kind of shows this soil just doesn't have those glues. Now, this is a surface sample. If I was really keen on this and wanted to go further with it, I'd go deeper in the soil and say, well, what, what about further down? when I use this cover crop. Of course, those are research questions, or if somebody had a question and they wanted to test that, this would be the way to do it. This will kind of be a useful contrast because this came up earlier, and this is a big issue up here. This test is great for clay soils, and particularly silty <coughs> soils. Soils with a lot of silt really tend to smear over and, sit and uh, silt in. <laughs> uh, they have a real hard time with soil structure. Silts are very, it's in between uh, it's kind of clayy, but it doesn't have all the, the good parts of clay that helps clay cement it, its own self together. You know, we make bricks out of clay, not silt, for a good reason. You need good clay to make good bricks, because clay wants to cement its own self, but silt doesn't want to. Okay, right away something comes up that was an issue before, and it's if you notice the water's kind of beating up on the sand because it's dry. Interesting issue with sands, as you know, sands, when they get really dry, they don't want water. They won't even take it. Thank you. you put water on it, it kind of <laughs> kind of just sits there and it, or it'll even run off. So sands are one of those things that, again, it's part of management. This test doesn't address that, but uh, you know that you want to keep a, a sand surface damp if you can. Mulches and, and compost are great on the surface of a sand because they help protect the, the, the sand from drying out so that when water does come and the mulch kind of, and the compost sort of mulch, the compost on the surface kind of slows down that rain, it gives the sand a chance to, to actually take it instead of just running away when the sand's dry. So the, the moist sand actually conducts water a lot faster than dry sand. It's kind of a counterintuitive thing. Another thing is... It's kind of handy. <laughs> In this case, kind of yeah. like real rain. <laughs> Another thing about sand is this structure idea. You know, we're talking about the soil structure. In clay, so important. Clay has no structure. It's just this, when it's wet, it's just this, this, this soup. Uh, when it dries out, if, it's, if it doesn't have good structure, it can become like a brick. So clay, um, you have to get the organic matter in it. One thing I often say is, anyone who's ever made concrete, knows that concrete is made with this Portland cement, it's this fine powder, it's clay, plus some sort of aggregate, something like sand or gravel, what have you. But you mix it wet with clean water, and then when, when it's wet, and then when it's dry, it sets up into a into concrete. Well, <laughs> what that is, that would be, that's like soil if you have a lot of clay in it, and you have some, a little bit of sand or rocks, and you plow it wet, when it dries and sets up, it can set up into concrete. It literally can. So 
Of course, if you use anyone who's ever made concrete knows that one of the rules is use clean water. Everything has to be clean. You don't want any dirt in there. Well, dirt, dirt is, in this case, organic matter. Organic matter is that thing that fouls the good concrete. So if there's a bunch of straw and, and dirty water to make this concrete, it, it would be it'd be breaking because all the everything wouldn't be joined to each other. It would be all that organic in the way. So in that way, then, it's funny how the organic matter in the soil, then in the clay soil, can help you when you plow, from it turning into concrete. Because it's, it's dirty water, that it's all that dirt, or that impurity in the concrete that keeps it from setting up hard. So that's, that's another way to think about this whole thing. To think about the, the utility of organic matter in clay, keeping that clay, those clay particles from touching each other to make a brick. Keep them all loose and kind of apart from each other so that when you hit it, the brick goes poof, and at least breaks. In sand, it's, as we said, it's a different story. Now, here, show this around. This is that sand sample. A lot of it fell through, a lot of it's still there. Well, one thing to keep in mind, one thing about sand, is it cheats this test. It turns out a lot of this, a lot of these sand grains that are on top here would never go through this, this sieve. Remember we said that this is a medium-sized sand sieve. That's the standard that we use. We have to, always have to use a standard. So if some of this is coarse sand that passed our, our test of being soil, but didn't fall through here, we'd, we'd say, oh boy, that held up great. Well, it, would be, it, it could never not hold up because it's too big. So of course, in our laboratory, we collect all this sand that won't pass. We'd rinse the sieve, and what will never go through, we'd weigh in the oven and subtract that and so we, we wouldn't be confounded by all that sand that would never go. We can still look at the effect of there, there's some some of the sand you can see there's some organic debris kind of holding it together when it's wet here. But like we said before, this this test, this particular test, really useful for clay, but for sand, our issue typically isn't this stability. We don't want to, we're worried about making concrete with our clay, but sand, as you know, even when it's pretty wet, it's still going to fall apart when it dries. It's not going to set up and make a brick. So sand is a different animal, and so when we finally get the score on the sand, we kind of discount it a little bit in our total analysis, because with sand, that's not really our issue. So it kind of tells us that not a whole lot of the sand did break down and go and go through. But I do have to say that for sand, this this isn't the most important of all those tests we do. We kind of discount this one because it's not so important for sand. But I did want to show that to kind of get that idea that for sand, it's not this test that's important so much, but some of the other ones. Sand, because it's so well aerated, it cleans itself out real well. So when you, it's kind of like someone who eats and has to eat every four hours. That would be a sand. The clay would be someone who eats and doesn't seem to have to eat till the next day or several days later, it seems. Clay tends to hold on to that organic matter better. Sand, because it breathes so well, helps those organisms breathe, and without even stirring it, starts to turn over that organic matter. And remember, you know, you wonder where all the organic matter goes. Why does the soil have to keep eating? Why can't I just put a bunch of manure on and be done? Come back five years from now, get manure again, do it again. It's been a while. Maybe I'll do it again. It's, it's these organisms eating, by the way, as they live and die and, and cycle, they breathe. And what they do is they breathe oxygen, and anything that breathes oxygen typically produces carbon dioxide. So if you have all this carbon in your organic matter that these critters are eating, some of the carbon dioxide is going off as their breath, their just respiration as they live. And so that's where a big pile of leaves in a compost pile, you turn it and it starts to shrink. Well, the leaves aren't just blowing away. It's actually all these critters 
breathing and eating, they're, they're still eating the leaves, even if they ate the leaves, it would just be that amount of bacteria if it ate the leaf, if it didn't respire. But because these things are breathing, that are get, a lot of organic matter is being converted to carbon dioxide and going off as gas. So in fact, some people say, uh, we're big, we do some work with these no-till farmers. They claim that when you, when you plow, you're starting a fire in your field because the critters then the, that eat organic matter have access to that organic matter and then eat, breathe well, and off goes carbon dioxide. You can't actually see the flames, but in terms of carbon dioxide, an awful lot of carbon dioxide, we've seen data that shows after plowing, a lot of carbon dioxide leaves the field. Well, all this carbon dioxide is leaving the field, that carbon is what makes organic matter organic matter, the carbon, that carbon dioxide that's leaving as gas is no longer in the field. So that's why these no-tillers, one of their big claims is that don't stir the soil, just leave it, and those critters will do their things at a natural rate rather than starting this big fire, this wildfire, and you lose all that carbon to the air.